they attack you? The big, that's a big, those are big guns. I'm scared. They don't even lie. I don't mess with a gun, man. That's just scary. I was gonna die. I don't know how. I had a plan. Yeah. 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 This video covers the events leading up to the death of a man from Tallahassee and another's desperate escape. On a warm day in Tallahassee, Florida, Hoyt Burge and Peter Turnay entered a house for a quick drug transaction, unaware they were stepping into a trap. This would result in Hoyt being killed and Turnay barely escaping with his life moments afterward. Every community, big or small, contains a drug scene connected by informal ties, including friends, dealers, suppliers, casual users, and addicts. People are familiar with each other in these circles, whether by name or reputation, as buyers, sellers, or possessors. Tallahassee, Florida, near the large Florida State University, is no exception. On May 8, 2017, a car arrived at a duplex on Mission Road near Florida State University. Shortly after, another car showed up with a man and two others. Peter Crackhead Pete Turnay, in the first car, had 10 OxyContin pills, known as Blues, for sale. From the second car, Hoyt Burge planned to introduce Pete to the buyer, Paige Vowell, his friend. Vowell lived there with her boyfriend, Paige Briggs. You're the first car that arrives there, correct? Yes, sir. You and Dee are sitting mm -hmm. there, uh, pulled into the driveway. Yes, sir. In a car that Mr. Briggs and any of the other occupants would not have recognized, agree? I would assume. Because you don't have frequent flyer miles over there, do you? No. You use those somewhere else? Yes, sir. So how long did you have to wait before Hoyt got there? Uh, within a minute or two. I mean, he pulled up pretty much right after I pulled up. Okay. So he pulls up, and there are two other occupants of his car, correct? Hoyt's in the back seat, yes, sir. Hoyt was in the back? Yes, sir. You knew the two gentlemen that uh, accompanied him? Mm, I didn't know them. Know their nicknames? Mm. You need to answer no, out loud. No, sir. The, and speaking of nicknames, you ever go by the nickname Crackhead Pete? Mm. People's called me that. Okay. So Hoyt gets out of the car and he comes up to your car. Is that accurate? Yes. You got out of your car? No. I stayed in my car with the seatbelt still on. Okay. And then Hoyt went up on his own? You didn't go into the house? No. Hoyt came to my vehicle. He came to my window and... I was going to give him, hey, here you go. And uh, he said, come on inside, let's go inside. I said, I don't want to go inside. Okay. Nobody else is outside at that point, correct? Uh, the female, the door's open. The females are kind of like, you know, not like, you know, in and out. They're not like sitting outside. They'll walk out. They weren't like just hanging outside, but the door's open. Two people that are in uh, Hoyt's car, they didn't come over to your window and talk to you, did they? No. They stayed in the car. Uh, they, I, think, I think they got out, but they didn't, they didn't go anywhere because, like, Hoyt basically told them, like, everybody stay out here. Okay. Uh, so Hoyt's given that instruction, correct? Yeah, he's telling everybody to basically stay out here. I mean, cause... Two females are up at the door, the entry to the house, correct? Yeah. I Hoyt, asked him. Hoyt gives you the instruction that, hey. No, he comes to my car. He comes, comes to your car and says that you can go in with him, right? Yeah. Okay. And I told him no. And I said, I want to stay here. And I, and I asked if my friend can come. And he said no. And then you went in. Uh, me and Hoyt went in. Vowell and her friend, Vicki Strickland, invited the men inside and locked the door behind them, trapping them unknowingly. Four armed men stormed in from a back room when they tried to start the sale. Two had pistols, one had a hammer, and the fourth, Patrick Bahrain, wielded an AK-47. Commands to hit the floor and seize their cell phones were shouted. Pete obeyed instantly and didn't resist. Did anybody say anything when they rushed out? You remember hearing any, any statements being made? Not really. It was all jibber to me then. I mean, that was, that was going on. There was, I, mean, I was still... And when you said Paige said something, so, what if, you don't remember what Paige said to you? Yeah. The only thing he was saying to me was, get the f*** down, get the f*** down, stay on the f***ing ground. If you f***ing move, I'll f***ing shoot you. Did you get down on the ground? <laughs> fuck yeah. <laughs> fuck yeah, bitch is big. It's a big, that's a big, it's a big, those were big guns. I was scared to death, I ain't gonna lie. <laughs> Did anybody attack you? Yeah, I mean, after, they basically got Hoyt, Hoyt, but. I mean, how, what, like, how did they attack Hoyt? Just came out of the room and just started, I mean, attacking, hitting them. I mean. What did they hit them with? I, I'm not even, to be honest, I'm not, I mean, I don't know, they could have put their pistols, like, I mean, multiple things, I don't really. Did anybody hit you? Yes. Who hit you? I didn't say they did. Um, I know Paige 
Paige hit me in the head. Because he was the one who wanted to gun over me. Like, you got it? What did Paige hit you with? Mm-hmm. You see? Uh-huh. You need, you, you need an ambulance to come check you out? No, I told him I was okay. All right, you don't want to get checked out? I could feel it rushing, dog. I could feel the blood like when he said, Phew. He just did one quick, Phew. What kind of gun was it? They had this long barrel, this long barrel gun. A shotgun, I am saying, I don't know. I'm not really familiar with guns. I don't, I don't mess with guns, man. That shit's scary. Okay. I thought I was going to die. I thought that was my last breath. I don't know how. That was it. You mixed those types of people. But well, why, did, why did they stop attacking you? They didn't think they, they hit me a few times. Because I, 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 my best bet was to earn their trust and get on their side. Mm-hmm. That was my best bet. Or you're going to die. Because I was the only one there besides Hoyt. So what happened to Hoyt? Because everybody talked out there, you know, even afterwards. I mean, the whole reason... And they were just even saying it during the, the reason those dudes came is Hoyt was supposed to rob them. <laughs> so this, this is what they were talking about? Yes, this is what they were Where saying. were you when they were talking, when they were talking about it? Sitting right there in the living room. You were sitting? I was sitting. I mean, I was there in the living room. I mean, they were talking amongst each other. Is that when you were on the, did you already get hit at this point? Yes. Okay. Well, where was Hoyt when they were talking about this? Talking about the... When they were talking about Hoyt trying to rob them, where was Hoyt? They were talking about being, he was already pretty, he was on the floor. He was on the floor? <laughs> I mean, as soon as, as soon as he basically got in there, uh, within 30 seconds of him being in there, 20 seconds of him being in there, me being in there also, um, they, when they attacked him, and he, all you can hear was him screaming as they chased him around the living room. Okay. Was Hoyt still screaming when they were talking about Hoyt trying to rob him? Were they still talking when Hoyt? Not that I know. Okay. Uh, so while they're talking, what happened? There wasn't really no talking. I mean, we, we, I mean, it's, it's simple. I mean, we, he came in and I said, Hoy, man, you got me out of here. I said, man, I, I told you I'd be somewhere. And then boom, and that's when they came out the back. And then, okay. and I was. So what ended up happening? He ended up, basically, they were there for Hoy. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm, all I'm thinking is, he's just going to kill me. He's going to kill me too. You know? And. I seen why they basically got him to the ground. I was like, I told the officers, I was sitting there and, uh, this is me basically the whole time. Once he got me down, and went this whole time. Uh-huh. So this is all I can see. And all I was like this the whole time. I just, I was like, please just don't pull the trigger. But, you know, this is all I can see like this because I couldn't, because every time I move or make a little sound, you know, uh, Paige was just, he hit with his gun. Uh-huh. He's like, you're fucking saying you're fucking saying And then I'm just trying to do whatever I can to stay alive. Mm-hmm. So what happened to Hoyt? I attacked him. Hoyt was basically running around, you know, trying to do whatever he can, screaming hard. And they're hitting him. Mm. Hoyt doesn't fall down on the ground. I'm already down on the ground. I can look because I'm facing him this way. I'm facing. I can see the woods a few feet away. I can see it. I mean, I can see every, you know, them hitting them. And um, I was like, that's kind of nippy, I know. But for there, they, I mean, I, I couldn't see because my head wasn't like this the whole time as I'm laying down. So I wasn't like that, you know. To be honest with you, I didn't want to, I want to see as little as possible. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I, I grabbed the gun from Patrick. What, what, what kind of gun did Patrick had? It was a big or small. It, was a, it wasn't a handheld. I, I then didn't really see it, to be honest, but it was a gun. So you grabbed Patrick's gun? Patrick's gun, and, and it went off. Boom. And that's all ours. Everybody, poof. And, you know, when everybody heard that, they were just, poof. You know, kind of spooked. And I, I thought I heard someone say, I'm hit. I want to say it was. Who said they were hit? I want to say it was Hoyt. Uh, he's like, I think I'm hit. And just kind of like, and that was that was the last I've heard of. It's the last the last voice I heard from Hoyt. Everything paused momentarily, as this turn of events was unexpected. For one group, it was just a drug deal. For the others, it was more, but not intended to end in murder. 
Before this incident, Briggs found out that Burge and another man, Michael Cooper, had been planning via social media to rob him of his drugs and steal his dog. At the trial, Briggs claimed he was aware of Birg's violent past and thefts, and these messages made him fear a robbery and potential harm from Birge. Mr. Briggs, where we left off is you're leaving where you had gone to get a haircut. Who was with you? Uh, just me and Paige Val. Uh, were you making a, her aware real time of the messages that you're looking at, that sort of thing? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, let's talk about what you knew also about Hoyt Burge. <clears throat> were you aware that Hoyt Burge previously committed assault? Yes, I was aware of that. Were you also aware that Hoyt Burge had previously committed burglaries? Correct. Yes, sir. All right. And likewise, were you also aware that Hoyt Burge had committed weapons offenses? Yes. All right. Um, let's help the jury with context. Did you know of any specific instances of involvement where Hoyt may have been violent or anything like that? Uh, before the incident happened, I've, I've heard of the four specific incidents. All right. Briggs explained that Birg's reputation made him fear for his safety and property. Instead of going to the police, which wasn't an option for several clear reasons, Briggs chose to handle it himself. He planned to outsmart the would-be robber. He had his girlfriend, Paige Vowell, reach out to Burge to arrange a purchase of prescription painkillers. When Burge agreed to organize the deal, she invited him to the duplex where the ambush was set. Briggs assembled his friends to scare and possibly assault Burge upon his arrival for the deal. Among them, Patrick Bahrain came equipped with a backpack filled with pistols, ammunition, and an AK-47 rifle. Bahrain believed these weapons would forcefully convey to Burge that he should fear Briggs and never think of robbing him again. The reason I have guns is because my dad was two gun shops in Miami and I've been talking safety my entire life. But uh, that is the only reason. However, the situation quickly spiraled out of control. While Ternay was clearly scared and gave up right away, Burge tried to escape, fighting against the attackers. Despite being hit with a hammer several times, he resisted, and it appeared he was trying to grab his own weapons, as seen by his hands moving towards his pockets. Bahrain noted, when Burge tried to grab Bahrain's AK-47, the gun fired, killing Burge instantly from a close-range shot. Who had the... Oh, yeah. See, that's, that's what I was trying to get at before. Because obviously nobody would ever do that. Point. You know what you're telling me is it, it didn't sound like they meant to pull the trigger. It was an accident. It wasn't supposed to go down like that. Yeah, and the, the thing is, I was still thinking it was the animal trigger, which was on the side. But that was good enough with the yank. Because he yanked it at an angle. The scenario quickly escalated from an attempt to scare an alleged troublemaker to the unintended killing of an invited guest. The group immediately scrambled to devise a plan to hide their actions. Pete, in sheer terror, did the only thing possible. He begged the others for his life, promising to keep the incident secret if they spared him. This plea saved his life. Yeah, but there's like, we didn't, they didn't plan on, we didn't plan, like, like Pete, you came in the wrong place at the wrong place. Time. That's what they told you? Yeah. Who told you that? Paige. Paige said Paige, that? Paige just said that. I mean, they said, you know, as they went out throughout the rest of the, you know, the night, as they're, you know, clean, doing whatever they're doing, trying to wash away whatever evidence or whatever they're trying to do. I just was like, I was just like this, like, wrong place, wrong time, goddamn right. So, what were they cleaning up? They were cleaning. I seen the girl. Um, they were they were Paige's Paige's girlfriend. Like Paige is there or so her. I'm sorry, I've been up for I don't know how long I've been doing this forever. She was clean. I seen I seen her clean the blood off the wall. Whoa. I don't know if she had anything part of it, but to be honest, I mean I would think that she would be a lure, but why not? Because Hoyt always had a weakness for women. Mm -hmm. He loves his girls, you know, and okay. I think so, she could have lured him in there. That's where, what I'm thinking. Where did they bring Hoyt? And I think I was like the bait or something. Like, you know, I was just, you know, innocent bystander type. Like, okay, we'll, we'll just use him. Mm -hmm. Wrong place, wrong time. 
And um, the war, what was the question? <coughs> so Paige, uh, Paige's girlfriend's cleaning blood off the wall. What did they do with Hoyt? My body stayed there for a while, for a little bit, until they were, and they just put like all kinds of things wrapped up in like either towels, you know, rugs, uh, like a little white clear tarp. <coughs> just whatever they could find to really he said there for a while as they discussed, you know, what they're going to do. And they kept asking me, Peter, I can't say anything, are you? Peter, I can't say anything, are you? And I uh, <clears> hope <throat> to roll. I said, no, I ain't going to say nothing, man. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I didn't think, it didn't matter anyway. I didn't think I was going to make it. I didn't think I was going to live. Uh -huh. I said, this is it, man. This is, I'm, I'm done. And they're like, so do you know what happened? And I was like, mm -mm. you know, that's the key. Survival. And whatever you can do to survive, do it. And that's what I did. After the incident, they wrapped Burge's body in a white plastic tarp, carried it out, and placed it in the trunk of Pete Turnay's silver Toyota Camry. Jesse Fox, a friend of Paige Briggs, had earlier reached out to buy drugs, but was told it wasn't a good time. Shortly after, Briggs called him back, asking for help with a situation. Upon arrival, Fox was briefed on the plan to stop Hoyt's robbery attempt given a pistol, and instructed to wait outside behind the house in case his assistance was needed. Fox witnessed the assault on Hoyt through a window and heard the gunshot. After entering and inquiring about the situation, he chose to flee, escaping out the back door, leaping over a fence, and running away. Later, as Burge's body was being loaded into the trunk of Pete's Toyota, Fox came back and offered Briggs and Vowell a getaway ride. They took the firearms with them and handed them over to Fox for disposal. Meanwhile, the rest proceeded to abandon the Toyota and Burge's body, with two attackers driving the car along with Pete. Who got the Camry? Uh, me, Patrick, and Sid. Sid drove, Sid goes, Sid says, I'll drive, he's the passenger. Did you ever see the girl? Yeah, the girl, she, she, uh, she rode with us. She got in the car. She got in the car? Yeah, because it seemed like Sid was, un, like, he didn't like that, that Patrick made the decisions, like, bring some girl in. And the girl said, it's weird because the girl said to um, Sid, like, you know, she was, she was a little drunk. She was like, I know what happened. Like, da 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 da. And Sid was like, you know, basically, like, what do you mean? What are you talking about? You know, but she didn't know what happened because I guess Patrick had to tell her. Someone had to tell her. I mean, she wasn't there. Right. Um, did anyone ever say her name? Any reference to her name? Man, I've never seen her before. Okay. Um, so she gets in, where did you guys go? Driving. No, oh, get in. <clears throat> they were talking about going to, Pastor was talking about, hey, I got a friend that we can go to. He's got plenty of plenty of land, you know, out in the boonies. And there's a little Monticello. And we had to keep Monticello, I think, my parents' house, you know, because it's not too far. We kind of live on the outskirts, but we did, my parents are by the Tallahassee Car Museum. Mm -hmm. And that's when I was, you know, I had told the guys earlier, yeah, I was like, man, I was like, you know, because I was saying anything, anything would help me. Like, I was like, I'll give you all money, I'll give you whatever. They had already took all my money out of my pocket. They took my phones, they took every my wallet, my driver's license. That's what they said. They continued to say, like, like, we know where you live, we know your parents, and we will kill you and your family if you say anything. That's mm -hmm. exactly what they said. And my mom's my world. Mm -hmm. So they stop anywhere? Do they go to Jefferson County or Monticello or? We go to, I ended up, I, hope, I don't know if they, but Sid ended up saying like, I told him I'd give money. This was earlier in the night after all this stuff, so I was all frantic. And he said like during the car ride as we're going down 90, he's like, I'll take you up on that. I was like, what? He goes, bring some, bring, how much money are you going to bring me? I said, uh, so I got about 400, $350, $400 in there or something, you know? Yeah, so, I bring it to you. And uh, he just got, he, he agreed. And the whole thing in the back of my head, I was like, I was hoping they'd say, I hope they don't say, let's, because they're going to do the body thing. And I was hoping they don't go do that first, because I'm figuring, if they're going out to the woods, they're going to kill me. They're mm -hmm. going to kill me. That's what they're going to do. I have to, I have, that's what I have them fearing. And uh, he ended up, um, he said, what? I was like, you just want to stop my house first? I said, and I said, well, I'll go ahead and get that for you. And I said, I said to him again, he said, yeah. So, you know, he pulls into, you know, Walden Road. That's where my parents stay at. <clears throat> and um, we're driving down the road. And I'm just like thinking, dude, like, what, what, what am I going to do? Like, how, what are they going to do? Are they going to walk me to the door? How's this going to be done? 
and uh, and uh, I just said, hey, I didn't tell them the house, even though they have my driver's license and my address, because they even told me plus they have it, because I don't have in my pockets or nothing. Um, I said, there's, there's my house, I can see it, because I know my neighborhood. I mean, I've lived there since, we lived there since 86. And as we're getting closer to my house, like probably a quarter mile, I'm just like, you know, yeah, I can see, you know, you can, you know, I can see pretty far. I was like, hey, I was like, yeah, it's coming up right here. You know, I didn't want to tell them where I lived at, even though they pretty much knew. Um, but I knew for that time being, I wanted to be safe. I was like, yeah, I want to make my mom safe. But I was like, as we passed the house, I was, passed my house, I was like, that road right here, just take a left. And I'm kind of just going. Do you know what road it was? It's the road right next to my parents' house. It's my parents' house, Cordova. Cordova. Oh, so they turned out Cordova? C-O-R-D-O-D-A. Yeah. Um, and Cordova is a very short street. It's probably about 40 yards long. Mm -hmm. It's just a little roundabout. Boom, and it comes back. There's probably sits about six six houses up there in the whole area. And I didn't know what I was. I was debating. Oh. Yeah, I was debating in my head. I was thinking, I'm going to do this. And I just said, park right here. Like, you go in the roundabout because you got a house as it goes around. So they're in the back as it gets toward the end of the street back to Walden. And I knew that there's a house right here. That where they couldn't, like if, I, if they stopped right here, I knew they couldn't really see me go to my actual house. And um, they just parked right there. And he's like, you gonna go get that? I was like, yeah, man, I'll go get it. He said, you got five minutes. You better be right in five minutes. <clears throat> and so I got a car. I walked slowly, like I had a game for something, you know, because sidewalk leads to the front door. And they can't see after so long. As soon as I knew they couldn't see, I ran to my house, and I know it's right next door, so I run. Mm -hmm. I'm beating on the door, boom, 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 boom. And my mom finally, first I'm trying to knock on it once. I didn't know if they could hear from that. That's how scared I was. Like I didn't know if they could hear. And eventually I could hear my mom like getting through, getting through and coming to the door. And she's taking first. She's like, she's open. I'm just like, she still tell you. I'm just like, get them, please. Like, and I went inside, and immediately first thing I do, I don't take a piss. I don't even take a, I don't take a breath of air. I, mom. And I'm trying to think how to say it, what to say, like, this is what happened. And I gave it all. I told her everything. And as I'm telling her, she's like, in the process, she's like calling on one. And uh, she's like, yeah, call him. You know? Uh, yeah, I said, that. and then she's talking to the officer. I guess on the phone. I said, man, this is serious, man. Those dudes have guns. They will, they just, you know, I mean, what the f the dude just died. Mm -hmm. I mean, dude, obviously they're not fucking off. And that was it. She called, we waited. And she wanted to keep going outside. My mom said, mom, do you just get the in the house, man, get the f in the house. These people are not playing. The officer went by, I guess, by itself, check things out. And she wanted to see to us. This, Mom, let them deal with this. That's their job. That's their job, not yours. I need you. Pete was eventually free, and the authorities were informed about the crime. Two of the men left, heading towards the city. They stopped at the U Club Apartments on North Woodward Avenue in Tallahassee, parked Pete's Camry in a quiet place, and covered it, effectively hiding it. Hoyt's body remained in the trunk in that parking lot overnight, while Pete spent much of the night at the police station, recounting the events. Overcoming his fear for his safety, he provided the crucial details needed for the police to proceed with their arrests. Within hours, the conspirators became defendants. Soon after Pete Turnay was detained and interrogated, the others involved were identified and taken into custody. Pete, having previously been in jail with Briggs and Bahrain, easily named them, while the rest were traced through nicknames and aliases. Meanwhile, forensic teams from the police department descended on the Mission Road home of Briggs and Vowell to secure the crime scene and collect any evidence left untouched by the assailants. Bahrain was discovered hiding at his girlfriend Brittany Guthrie's apartment. During the search, police found ammunition magazines for the weapons and a car cover box purchased from AutoZone. An officer checking local parking lots spotted a covered car at the U-Club apartments with part of a bumper sticker visible underneath the cover, showing what seemed to be blood. Upon removing the cover, they confirmed it was Pete Ternay's Toyota Camry, technically stolen. When the trunk was opened, they discovered Hoyt Burge's body wrapped in a white plastic tarp. Within hours, all involved in the crime were detained, except for Fox, who had helped Briggs and Vowell escape from the scene and was assigned the job of disposing of the guns. It took a few days for the authorities to find him. After a brief standoff, Fox surrendered to the police and revealed he had stashed the guns in a hollow tree, planning to sell them later. 
Among those arrested, Vicki Strickland faced no punishment, as it soon became evident that she had no prior knowledge of the plan and was not a willing participant. The trials for those involved started a year later, in April 2018. Paige Vowell, Paige Briggs's girlfriend, testified during her trial on April 26, stating that at the time of the incident, she was battling severe drug addictions to methamphetamines and painkillers. In 2017, you kind of had a problem, didn't you? Uh, I did. You had a big drug problem, didn't you? I did. Tell the jury the extent of your drug problem. Were you doing drugs? What type of drugs were you doing? How often were you doing them? Um, I was using methamphetamines and opiates, mainly mainly blues or Roxycontin. Okay. You had a pretty bad addiction to them, didn't you? I did. Were these drugs that you basically needed to function daily with? Yes, I had to have every day. Okay. Did your relationship Paige, with Paige Briggs turn out of a desire to get high, pretty much? Yes. Did you become acquainted with him because he supplied you with drugs? Um, Tell the jury how you got acquainted with him. Um, well, we, we had just... I met him um, while drinking one night, and then the next day he introduced me to meth. And from then on, it's all I did, all day, every day. Okay. Did you know him to be a, a drug seller, dealer? He yes, he drugs. did turn into, yeah, he, yes. Okay. And it's my understanding, well, at least you've heard the testimony like me, that you got involved with Mr. Briggs about six months prior to when this happened. Is that correct? That's correct. She proceeded to describe her acquaintance with Hoyt Burge. Did you also know Hoyt Burge? I did know Hoyt. How did you know Hoyt Burge? Um, using drugs and hanging out. Was he someone that would supply you with drugs as well? Yes, he did. Did you all do drugs together? We did. Were you ever romantically involved? No, he was just a really good friend. The home she lived in with Briggs was a hub for drug dealings by Briggs and a constant gathering spot for people. She depicted it as a place where meth use happened at all times, with no one sleeping and people continuously arriving and leaving. She then explained to the jury the dynamics and evolution of the relationships among everyone involved. Uh, Stan, what, Stanley West and Vicki Strickland were, were frequent overnight guests at the Mission Roadhouse, correct? Yes, they were there for extended periods of time. Okay. What about David Howard? Um, he would come over sometimes to discuss his, his business he was trying to launch. Uh, it's a party bus thing that he was trying to launch with Page Briggs. Uh, they, were, they were trying to engage in starting a business? Uh, a party bus. A party bus, okay. What about uh, Jesse Fox? Did you know him? Yes, I did. Tell the jury how you knew Jesse Fox. Jesse Fox would come over and buy drugs from Paige Briggs, and he also um, worked with him for a little bit. Okay. And it's my understanding when Paige was, boy Paige, Mr. Briggs, wasn't selling drugs, he was in some type of pool business, is that correct? Yes, that was, uh, he was until he eventually lost his job due to, you know, the drug use. All right. And tell the jury how you knew Patrick Burain. Patrick Burain sold um, Paige Briggs um, weed, and Paige Big Briggs sold weed as well. So he sold Paige Briggs larger quantities, and that's how they knew each other, and that's how he came over to the house quite often. Okay. Now, as far as Hoyt Burge, he had come over to this house on Mission Road multiple times prior to the night he was killed, correct? Yes, he has been over quite often. And you would do drugs there with them a lot, correct? Correct. Okay. And was Mr. Briggs present when y'all would do drugs sometimes? He, he was. Okay. And other people were present as well. Right. right? Right. Vowell then detailed the events of the day leading up to the fatal confrontation. May 8th. Let's talk about that day, okay? Okay. Start with the best you can. Every detail that you can remember what you did from the moment you woke up on May 8th. I woke up um, and Paige had mentioned to me that I needed to take him to his probation office. 
I then proceeded to, uh, later on, before we went to the, uh, his probation office, I had contacted Hoyt to try and, well actually I had been talking to him earlier that day, asking him when Katie's funeral was, a, was a mutual friend that had passed away. And then I asked him if I could get any, um, any if he had any blues that I could buy. Um, from then, me and Paige uh, went to go to his probation office. I dropped him off. He saw his probation officer. Did anyone else go to the probation office with you and Paige? No. Okay. I didn't mean to interrupt you. What and happened next? Did you go to probation? Yes, we went to his probation office. I waited outside um, on my phone. And now, were you? This may sound like a stupid question. Were you driving the car? I was driving the car. What car was it? It was Stan's car. Stan's car. Mm -hmm. Okay. I assumed that Vicky and Stan maybe were at the house still when you got up. Yes, they were. Okay. Um, I don't think we had been to sleep though. So. Would you have been doing drugs? I assume the night I mean, before. There is. It was always doing drugs. So. Okay. Um. <clears throat> After his probation office, I took him to um, go get his hair cut. We were waiting outside, and he he told me that um, we he didn't need to get his hair cut, that someone was planning to rob him. Mike, or, and I asked him who, and he said, um, Coop. Okay. This is the first time that you learned of a robbery, is that correct? Yes. Okay, and it was your understanding that Coop wanted to rob him? Yes. Okay. But you, and you had already contacted Hoyt prior in the day, if I'm understanding you correctly, to get blues, correct? Right. Okay. Well, what happened when Hoyt said that? Keep telling the jury what happened in um, the progress. Well, um, he told me that Coop was planning to rob him, so we went immediately back to the house. Later on, he's, you know, he's trying okay. to... Okay. Stop for a second. Okay. When you get back to the house, who's at the house? Um, Stan, Stan and Vicky and Patrick Brain and um, I don't think David's there. I'm not sure, but okay. I don't think he's there. When you get to the house, how much time has passed? I mean, I'm assuming you don't wake up like a normal individual like at 8 a.m. I mean, we hadn't been to bed yet. All so. right. In terms of time frame, when you get back um, to the house, what time is it? Maybe 2 p.m. Early afternoon. Early afternoon. And um, we were just, you know, still doing, you know, we're passing around the little bubble thing. What's a bubble thing? It's what you smoke meth out of. Okay. When Paige Briggs had told you about this robbery, what was your thought regarding it? Well, I mean, what? that's not something that people are normally told. What did you think of it? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I thought it was crazy, but then again, that I, I mean, you hear about stuff like that all the time when people that do meth, everyone's trying to rob everybody. I didn't did think much think of that it. Did you think that meant that someone was going to rob you all where you were there with guns, like home invasion robbery? Did you think it was a robbery that was going to happen when you weren't there and you were going to catch them? Tell the jury what uh, you thought and what you do. I thought that, you know, Paige, Paige only told me that Coop was trying to rob him. I knew Coop. I, I was friends with Coop. I didn't really think anything of it that, I didn't really think anything of it. I, he just said that Coop was planning to rob him. Did you think that it was just him in a, a twacked out state for a better uh, description? I just thought he was going to rob Paige for his um, meth, okay. which often happens. People steal People's drugs did from. you think that it was Paige just acting stupid or crazy, or did you really believe him? I really believed him. I mean, but I wasn't really concerned about that. I, I honestly, I was starting to go into withdrawal, so I was, I wasn't, I, I, I wasn't concerned about that. Um, he, everybody was getting ready. I mean, he was getting ready. He had there was cameras that he was you know making sure that he could see in case Coop came to rob him. Okay, and when you've gotten back to the house, I think you identified you get there with Paige Briggs. Vicky's already there, correct? Correct. Stan's already there. Correct. Okay, Patrick's there. Correct. And David Howard shows up at some point in time. Yes. Okay. Uh, what do you see them doing, if anything, in the house? Um, well, really, we're just using drugs, like we're just smoking and, and... And let me ask you a question about that. After you report to probation, 
you kind of know you're not going to get a urine test for a while, correct? Right. So it was maybe the drug usage even a little more heavier by certain individuals? Oh, uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Um, Keep telling the jury what happened. Well, um, Paige had asked me um, if he could get some blues. Paige uh, Briggs. Briggs, yes. He asked me if I could text Hoyt and get some blues. I told him I had already, I, Hoyt was already going to come by so I could get blues. And he said, good, I, um, I want to talk to him when he comes by. That's all I knew. I mean, that's all that happened. And from then till Hoyt got there, I was just okay. smoking. Vowell's account shed new light on the day's events. While it didn't change the fact that Beerge and Pete Turnay were ambushed, it emphasized the heightened paranoia about the anticipated robbery among those in the house, aggravated by lack of sleep and extensive methamphetamine use. This created a highly unstable environment, and the presence of firearms only increased the risk of violence. That only one person died could almost be seen as fortunate. During cross-examination, the prosecution presented a different perspective of Vowell, suggesting she was more than just a victim of circumstance and drug addiction. Uh, Hoyt Burge liked you, didn't he? Um, I guess, yes. Was he sweet on you? He was nice to me. Was he a little too sweet sometimes? No. You didn't say that? I don't recall ever saying that. So the law enforcement officer was mistaken or lying that testified that you said that? I'm not saying that he is, but I was under the influence of Xanax and I don't remember, I don't recall any of that. I took a lot of Xanax, like Did bars. you hit Hoyt Burge? No. How do you know? You were under the I influence wasn't of Xanax? Not, later that night, how could you possibly know? You don't know anything else because you're under the influence of Xanax. You don't know the answer to these questions. I remember, but I remember that night very clearly. Briggs was ticked off about the Facebook messages, correct? Between Hoyt and Coop. Um, I guess he was. And when you were asked on direct about that, you kept saying Coop, Coop, Coop. He was mad at Coop, but he was mad at Hoyt too, right? I mean, he said that he had wanted to talk to wanted to talk to Hoyt. Wanted to talk to him? Wanted to talk to Hoyt and ask him why Coop wanted to rob him. What he said was he wanted to teach him a lesson, isn't that right? No. Isn't that what you told Don Carmen? No. He wanted to rough him up, isn't that I'm, what he said? No. I've never said that. Okay, so is Hoyt Briggs the kind of guy that talks out his problems when somebody's trying to steal his drugs? I don't know. I'm sorry, I don't, Paige what do you Briggs. Mean? I didn't know that Hoyt was a part of that. You didn't know that Hoyt was a part of the plan to rob? Yes, I did not know until after. So when Paige Briggs looked at the phone, uh, the messages that were left open on his phone. And he showed them to Pete. And he screenshotted them, cared enough to screenshot them, right? We've seen evidence of I, that here today. Yeah, I, I'm a, I, yes. But he didn't show them to you. He showed them to me after. After what? After Hoyt died. I had no idea. He I didn't asked even you know. Did Hoyt over there? Did he not? No, I had already was. I had already called Hoyt to have him come over. Why did you tell Donald Carmen that Briggs wanted you to get Hoyt over there so that he could rough him up? I didn't tell him that. So he's mistaken or lying? He's lying. And the officer that says you said Hoyt was a little too sweet is mistaken or lying. I didn't say that. I said I don't recall. I do not recall that car ride at all. And you didn't think anything about him wanting to talk to Hoyt? No, I did not. Right. And when Stan and Vicky went to pick up a crap load of guns, you didn't think anything of that? I didn't even know they went to go pick up a crap load of guns. And when people were walking around your home wearing bulletproof vests, you didn't think anything of that? He wasn't wearing a bulletproof vest. Okay. And when you called Hoyt to come over, were you flirtatious with him? No, Hoyt's always flirtatious with me. And were you flirtatious back? No, I was nice. We're friends. Did he know that your boyfriend was there? Yes. Why did everybody park somewhere else? Why was the house all dark? I don't know. I didn't have a car. Neither did Paige.
I don't know what other people were doing. I can't, I can't say what other people were doing or what other people were thinking. I can only say what I know I was thinking no, and what I'm, I was doing. I'm asking about you, ma'am. Did it seem strange to you that no cars were parking in front of your house even though you had seven people over there? No, I did not. Did it seem strange to you that at a party house that parties all night with music blaring all night and black lights and whatever, God knows whatever else, that all the lights were out? I didn't know all the lights were out. Did it seem strange to you that after Hoyt gets a phone call and announce, I mean, so sorry, that Paige gets a phone call and announces that the victim, Hoyt, is on his way over, everyone gets up and goes to their places? I, no one, that didn't happen. You mentioned that everyone did get up and go to other rooms. <clears throat> no, I didn't. You didn't say that all the boys were in another room. I said that they were chilling in another room, using drugs and stuff like they usually always are. And did they may remain really quiet for about five minutes between the time that Paige got the phone call and made an announcement and the time that Hoyt knocked on the door? I don't know. I wasn't taking auditory records of what okay. was going on. But would it seem odd to you if everyone got up and went to other rooms and stayed perfectly quiet for five minutes in the dark? If that's what, I mean, that would be odd if that's what happened, but that's not what happened. So you didn't get any clue about what was going on in the minutes that led up no, to Hoyt coming up to that door? If I had known anything was going to happen to Hoyt, I would have never let him come in that door, ever. Did you lock the door behind Hoyt and Pete? I don't know if I locked it, but I know whenever we do drug deals, we usually do have the door locked. If it was me or somebody else, I don't know. What type of locks did you have on that door? D a deadbolt. And how is it that if you know what was going to happen, you would have done something to stop it? Weren't you too afraid to do anything to stop it? Yeah, that was after something had happened. Before, I had no idea anything, anything was going to happen. Right, but you still got the four armed men present there, right? Before. They weren't armed. I didn't see anyone armed. And these guys aren't always armed? I thought you said there were always guns. There's always guns in the house. But there's not always people walking around with guns. Correct. But in this case, there were. After it happened, yes. And before it happened. When they came barging in the room. So are you saying that you did not see any guns prior to them barging in the room? No, I did not see anyone walking around with guns. And you're saying that nobody was wearing a bulletproof vest? I don't know if it was, I mean, Paige, I don't know if he was wearing a bulletproof vest or not. Because it's not like he, he, he has worn, he's worn these before. I mean, I can't recall. I don't know. You're don't know a convicted he... felon, aren't you? Yes. You're the gatekeeper to a pretty big time meth house, aren't you? The gatekeeper, I mean, that's what... Jesse referred it to as, but I, I wouldn't call myself the gatekeeper. You to live a with, house. hang out, and run with people that always possess firearms. Isn't that right? I was hanging out with people I shouldn't have been. Yet. Before concluding the state's case against Vowell, prosecutor Georgia Kappelman aimed to highlight the event's seriousness. She remained silent for two minutes mirroring the duration Beerge was attacked while displaying photos of his bloodied and battered body to the jury. After this emotional pause, she resumed speaking. And then Hoyt was shot, and for 10 to 20 seconds, he laid there bleeding. He observes her yelling obscenities at Hoyt, and he even sees her get a lick in. She's all in for this, folks. And she does absolutely nothing to help him. He laid there bleeding, asking for help, begging these people that he knew to call someone. And then he began to choke on his own blood, and then he lost consciousness. And all of these people stood around and watched. Although medical intervention could have saved this man, these people did nothing. Just watch this young man die. You have learned negative information about Hoyt Burge during this trial. The defense says this is just a bunch of druggies doing what druggies do. He was over there to sell pills. He was going to rob. Hoyt Burge was a human being. After five hours of deliberation, 
the jury convicted Paige Vowell of first-degree murder and kidnapping. The conviction was based on evidence that she was aware of the plans to harm Hoyt and testimony from another defendant, Fox, who claimed he saw her strike Hoyt at least once with the hammer. Vowell was sentenced to life in prison. Paige Briggs, David Howard, and Stanley West were all convicted of third-degree murder, two counts of false imprisonment and theft, each receiving 30-year prison sentences. Patrick Bahrain was found guilty of third-degree murder and false imprisonment as well, but he was sentenced to 40 years in prison. Hoyt Burge was drawn into a setup and betrayed by someone he thought was a friend, regardless of his own plans for a robbery. Peter Turnay, merely intending to sell drugs, found himself in an extremely dangerous mess. One survived, while the other was killed and left in a car's trunk. For the survivor, the small comfort in this horrific ordeal might come from managing to stay composed and finding a way to escape. Remember, it's your curiosity that fuels this channel. Keep exploring, stay inspired, and join us for more amazing content next time.